Part six of Volume three of Plutarch's Parallel Lives. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Volume three of Plutarch's Parallel Lives of the Noble Greeks and Romans, translated by Bernadotte Perrin. Fabius Maximus, Part two. After this, he was summoned to Rome by the priest to assist in sundry sacrifices, and put his forces in charge of Minicius, who was not to give battle, nor engage the enemy in any way. Such were not only the commands of Fabius as dictator, but also his reiterated counsels and requests. To all these, Minicius gave little heed, and straightway began to threaten the enemy. One day he noticed that Hannibal had sent the larger part of his army off to forage, whereupon he attacked the residue drove them headlong inside their trenches, slew many of them, and inspired them all with the fear of being held in siege by him. When Hannibal's forces were reunited in their camp, Minicius effected a safe retreat, thereby filling himself with measureless boastfulness and his soldiery with boldness. An exaggerated version of the affair speedily made its way to Rome, and Fabius, when he heard it, said he was more afraid of the success of Minicius than he would be of his failure but the people were exalted in spirit, and joyfully ran to a meeting in the forum. There Matilius, their tribune, mounted the rostra and harangued them, extolling Minicius, but denouncing Fabius, not as a weakling merely, nor yet as a coward, but actually as a traitor. He also included in his accusations the ablest and foremost men of the state besides. They had brought on the war at the outset, he said, in order to crush the people, and had at once flung the city into the hands of a man with sole and absolute authority, that he might, by his dilatory work, give Hannibal an assured position, and time to reinforce himself with another army from Libya, on the plea that he had Italy in his power. Then Fabius came forward to speak, but wasted no time on a defense of himself against the tribune. He simply said that the sacrifices and sacred rites must be performed as quickly as possible, so that he might proceed to the army and punish Minicius for engaging the enemy contrary to his orders. Thereupon a great commotion spread swiftly through the people. They realized the peril that threatened Minicius. For the dictator has the power to imprison and put to death without trial, and they thought that the wrath of Fabius, provoked in a man of his great gentleness, would be severe and implacable. Wherefore they were all terrified and held their peace, excepting only Matilius. He enjoyed immunity of person as a tribune of the people, for this is the only magistracy which is not robbed of its power by the election of a dictator. It abides when the rest are abolished, and vehemently charged and prayed the people not to abandon Minicius, nor permit him to suffer the fate which Manlius Torquatus inflicted upon his son, whom he beheaded although crowned with laurel for the greatest prowess, but to strip Fabius of his tyrant's power and entrust the state to one who was able and willing to save it. The rabble were moved by such utterances. They did not dare to force Fabius to resign his sovereignty, unpopular as he was, but they voted that Minicius should have an equal share in the command, and should conduct the war with the same powers as the dictator, a thing which had not happened before in Rome. A little while afterwards, it is true, it happened again, namely, after the disaster at Cannae. At that time Marcus Junius the dictator was in the field and at home it became necessary that the Senate should be filled up, since many senators had perished in the battle. They therefore elected Fabius Butus a second dictator. But he, after acting in that capacity in choosing the men to fill up the Senate, at once dismissed his lictors, eluded his escort, plunged into the crowd, and straightway went up and down the forum arranging some business matter of his own, and engaging in affairs like a private citizen. Now that they had invested Minicius with the same powers as the dictator, the people supposed that the latter would feel shorn of strength and altogether humble, but they did not estimate the man aright. For he did not regard their mistake as his own calamity, but was like Diogenes the wise man, who, when some one said to him, These folk are ridiculing you, said, But I am not ridiculed. He held that only those are ridiculed who are confounded by such treatment and yield their ground. So Fabius endured the situation calmly and easily, so far as it affected himself, thereby confirming the axiom of philosophy that a sincerely good man can neither be insulted nor dishonored. But because it affected the state, he was distressed by the folly of the multitude. They had given opportunities to a man with a diseased military ambition, and fearful lest this man, utterly crazed by his empty glory and prestige, 
should bring about some great disaster before he could be checked, he set out in all secrecy from the city. When he reached the camp, he found that Minicius was no longer to be endured. He was harsh in his manner, puffed up with conceit, and demanded the sole command in his due turn. This Fabius would not grant, feeling that the sole command of a part of the army was better than the command of the whole in his turn. The first and fourth legions he therefore took to himself, and gave the second and third to Minicius, the allied forces also being equally divided between them. When Minicius put on lofty airs and exulted because the majesty of the highest and greatest office in the state had been lowered and insulted on his account, Fabius reminded him that his contention was not with Fabius, but rather, were he wise, with Hannibal. If, however, he was bent on rivalry with his colleague in office, he must see to it that the man who had been triumphantly honored by his fellow-citizens should not be proved more careless of their salvation and safety than the man who had been ingloriously outraged by them. But Minicius regarded all this as an old man's dissimulation, and, taking the forces allotted to him, went into camp apart by himself, while Hannibal, not unaware of what was going on, kept a watchful eye on everything. Now there was a hill between him and the Romans which could be occupied with no difficulty, and which, if occupied, would be a strong site for a camp, and in every way sufficient. The plain round about, when viewed from a distance, was perfectly smooth and level, but really had sundry small ditches and other hollow places in it. For this reason, though it would have been very easy for him to get possession of the hill by stealth, Hannibal had not cared to do so, but had left it standing between the two armies in the hope that it might bring on a battle. But when he saw Minicius separated from Fabius, in the night he scattered bodies of his soldiers among the ditches and hollows, and at break of day, with no attempt at concealment, sent a few to occupy the hill, that he might seduce Minicius into an engagement for it. And this actually came to pass. First Minicius sent out his light-armed troops, then his horsemen, and finally, when he saw Hannibal coming to the support of his troops on the hill, he descended into the plain with all his forces in battle array. In a fierce battle he sustained the discharge of missiles from the hill, coming to close quarters with the enemy there, and holding his advantage, until Hannibal, seeing that his enemy was happily deceived, and was opposing the rear of his line of battle to the troops, who had been placed in ambush, raised the signal. At this his men rose up on all sides, attacked with loud cries, and slew their foes who were in the rear ranks. Then indescribable confusion and fright took possession of the Romans. Minicius himself felt all his courage shattered, and looked anxiously now to one and now to another of his commanders, no one of whom dared to hold his ground, nay, all urged their men to flight, and a fatal flight too. For the Numidians, now masters of the situation, galloped round the plain and slew them as they scattered themselves about. Now that the Romans were in such an evil pass, Fabius was not unaware of their peril. He had anticipated the result, as it would seem, and had his forces drawn up under arms, wisely learning the progress of events not from messengers, but by his own observations in front of his camp. Accordingly, when he saw the army of Minicius surrounded and confounded, and when their cries, as they fell upon his ears, showed him that they no longer stood their ground, but were already panic-stricken and routed, he smote his thigh, and with a deep groan said to the bystanders, Hercules, how much sooner than I expected, but later than his own rash eagerness demanded, has Minicius destroyed himself? Then, ordering the standards to be swiftly advanced and the army to follow, he called out with a loud voice, Now, my soldiers, let every man be mindful of Marcus Minicius, and press on to his aid, for he is a brilliant man and a lover of his country. And if his ardent desire to drive away the enemy has led him into any error, we will charge him with it later. Well, then, as soon as he appeared upon the scene, he routed and dispersed the Numidians who were galloping about in the plain. Then he made against those who were attacking the rear of the Romans under Minicius, and slew those whom he encountered. But the rest of them, ere they were cut off and surrounded in their own turn, as the Romans had been by them, gave way and fled. Then Hannibal, seeing the turn affairs had taken, and Fabius, with a vigor beyond his years, ploughing his way through the combatants up to Minicius on the hill, put an end to the battle, signalled a retreat, and led his Carthaginians back to their camp, the Romans also being glad of a respite. It is said that as Hannibal withdrew, he addressed to his friends some such pleasantry as this about Fabius. Verily, did I not often prophesy to you that the cloud, which we saw hovering above the heights, would one day burst upon us in a drenching and furious storm? 
After the battle, Fabius despoiled all of the enemy whom he had slain, and withdrew to his camp, without indulging in a single haughty or invidious word about his colleague. And Minicius, assembling his own army, said to them, Fellow-soldiers, to avoid all mistakes in the conduct of great enterprises is beyond man's powers. But when a mistake has once been made, to use his reverses as lessons for the future is the part of a brave and sensible man. I therefore confess that while I have some slight cause of complaint against fortune, I have larger grounds for praising her. For what I could not learn in all the time that preceded it, I have been taught in the brief space of a single day, and I now perceive that I am not able to command others myself, but need to be under the command of another, and that I have all the while been ambitious to prevail over men of whom to be outdone were better. Now in all other matters the dictator is your leader, but in the rendering of thanks to him I myself will take the lead, and will show myself first in following his advice and doing his bidding. After these words he ordered the eagles to be raised, and all to follow them, and led the way to the camp of Fabius. When he had entered this, he proceeded to the general's tent, while all were lost in wonder. When Fabius came forth, Minicius had the standards planted in front of him, and addressed him with a loud voice as father, while his soldiers greeted the soldiers of Fabius as patrons, the name by which freedmen address those who have set them free. When quiet prevailed, Minicius said, Dictator, you have on this day won two victories, one over Hannibal through your valor, and one over your colleague through your wisdom and kindness. By the first you saved our lives, and by the second you taught us a great lesson, vanquished as we were by our enemy to our shame, and by you to our honor and safety. I call you by the excellent name of Father, because there is no more honorable name which I can use, and yet a father's kindness is not so great as this kindness bestowed by you. My father did but beget me, while to you I owe not only my own salvation, but also that of all these men of mine. So saying, he embraced Fabius and kissed him, and the soldiers on both sides in like manner embraced and kissed each other, so that the camp was filled with joy and tears of rejoicing. After this, Fabius laid down his office, and consuls were again appointed. The first of these maintained the style of warfare which Fabius had ordained. They avoided a pitched battle with Hannibal, but gave aid and succor to their allies, and prevented their falling away. But when Terentius Varro was elevated to the consulship, a man whose birth was obscure, and whose life was conspicuous for servile flattery of the people and for rashness, it was clear that in his inexperience and temerity he would stake the entire issue upon the hazard of a single throw. For he used to shout in the assemblies that the war would continue as long as the city employed men like Fabius as its generals, but that he himself would conquer the enemy the very day he saw them. And not only did he make such speeches, but he also assembled and enrolled a larger force than the Romans had ever employed against any enemy. Eighty-eight thousand men were arrayed for battle, to the great terror of Fabius and all sensible Romans. For they thought their city could not recover if she lost so many men in the prime of life. Now Paulus Amilius was the colleague of Terentius, a man of experience in many wars, but not acceptable to the people, and crushed in spirit by a fine which they had imposed upon him. Therefore Fabius tried to rouse and encourage him to restrain the madness of his colleague, showing him that he must struggle to save his country, not so much from Hannibal as from Terentius. The latter, he said, was eager to fight because he did not see where his strength lay, the former because he saw his own weakness. But, said he, it is to me, O Paulus, that more credence should be given in regard to Hannibal's affairs, and I solemnly assure you that, if no one shall give him battle this year, the man will remain in Italy only to perish, or will leave it in flight since even now, when he is thought to be victorious and to be master of the country, not one of his enemies has come over to his side, and not even so much as the third part of the force which he brought from home is still left. To this Paulus is said to have answered, If I consult my own interests, O Fabius, it is better for me to encounter the spears of the enemy than to face again the votes of my fellow citizens. But if the state is in such a pass, I will try to be a good general in your opinion." rather than in that of all the rest who so forcibly oppose you. With this determination, Paulus went forth to the war. But Terentius, insisting on his right to command a day in turn, and then encamping over against Hannibal by the river Aphidus and the town called Cannae, at break of day put on the signal for a battle, a scarlet tunic displayed above the general's tent. At this even the Carthaginians were confounded at first, 
seeing the boldness of the Roman general and the number of his army, which was more than double their own. But Hannibal ordered his forces to arm for battle, while he himself, with a few companions, rode to the top of a gently sloping ridge, from which he watched his enemies as they formed in battle array. When one of his companions, named Gisco, a man of his own rank, remarked that the number of the enemy amazed him, Hannibal put on a serious look and said, Gisco, another thing has escaped your notice which is more amazing still. And when Gisco asked what it was, It is the fact, said he, that in all this multitude there is no one who is called Gisco. The jest took them all by surprise and set them laughing, and as they made their way down from the ridge, they reported the pleasantry to all who met them, so that great numbers were laughing heartily, and Hannibal's escort could not even recover themselves. The sight of this infused courage into the Carthaginians. They reasoned that their general must have a mighty contempt for the enemy if he laughed and jested so in the presence of danger. In the battle Hannibal practiced a double strategy. In the first place he took advantage of the ground to put the wind at his back. This wind came down like a fiery hurricane, and raised a huge cloud of dust from the exposed and sandy plains, and drove it over the Carthaginian lines, hard into the face of the Romans, who turned away to avoid it, and so fell into confusion. In the second place he formed his troops as follows. The sturdiest and most warlike part of his force he stationed on either side of the centre, and manned the centre itself with his poorest soldiers, intending to use this as a wedge jutting out far in advance of the rest of his line. But orders were given to the picked troops, when the Romans should have cut the troops in the centre to pieces, and pursued them hotly as they retreated and formed a deep hollow, and so got within their enemy's line of battle, then to turn sharply from either side, smite them on the flanks, and envelope them by closing in upon their rear. And it was this which seems to have produced the greatest slaughter. For the centre gave way and was followed by the Romans in pursuit, Hannibal's line of battle thus changing its shape into that of a crescent, and the commanders of the picked troops on his wings wheeled them swiftly to the left and right, and fell upon the exposed sides of their enemy, all of whom, except those who retired before they were surrounded, were then overwhelmed and destroyed. It is said, further, that a strange calamity befell the Roman cavalry also. The horse of Paulus, as it appears, was wounded and threw his rider off, and one after another of his attendants dismounted and sought to defend the consul on foot. When the horsemen saw this, supposing that a general order had been given, they all dismounted and engaged the enemy on foot. On seeing this, Hannibal said, this is more to my wish than if they had been handed over to me in fetters. But such particulars as these may be found in the detailed history of the war. As for the consuls, Varro galloped off with a few followers to the city of Venusia, but Paulus, caught in the deep surges of that panic flight, and covered with many missiles which hung in his wounds, weighed down in body and spirit by so vast a misfortune, sat down, leaning against a stone, and waiting for an enemy to dispatch him. His head and face were so profusely smeared with blood that few could recognize him. Even his friends and retainers passed him by without knowing him. Only Cornelius Lentulus, a man of the patrician order, saw who he was, and leaping from his horse, led him to Paulus and besought the council to take him and save himself for the sake of his fellow citizens, who now more than ever needed a brave commander. But Paulus rejected this prayer, and forced the youth, all tears, to mount his horse again, and then rose up and clasped his hand and said, Lentulus, tell Fabius Maximus, and be thyself a witness to what thou tellest, that Paulus Aemilius was true to his precepts up to the end, and broke not one of the agreements made with him, but was vanquished first by Varro and then by Hannibal. With such injunctions he sent Lentulus away, then threw himself in the midst of the slaughter and perished. And it is said that fifty thousand Romans fell in that battle, that four thousand were taken alive, and that after the battle there were captured in both consular camps no less than ten thousand. End of Fabius Maximus, Part Two.